And so rather than always having, you know, every day of the week is a is a high carb breakfast, then there might be some days of the week where you're having a higher fat, higher protein, lower carb breakfast. And so you start to look at where athletes are putting their, you know, when they're training in the day, whether it's lifting or whether it's their skill-based training, and start to prioritize carbohydrates around the training. And of course, the more intense the training, then the more carbohydrates there can be on board. And, you know, it's going to be individual to the, uh, to the athlete. Welcome to the Train With Sand podcast, where our goal is to help you look, feel, and perform like an athlete. In each episode, we're interviewing experts in training, nutrition, and sports performance who will help you separate fact from fiction in the fitness industry. Now, here's your host, a former professional athlete, certified personal trainer, and nutrition coach, Sam Barksdale. What's up, guys? Welcome back to episode number nine of the Train with Zan podcast. My name is Zan Barksdale. I'm your host, and thank you for tuning in today. Today's episode is a special one. Uh, the guest is probably one of the most well-rounded speakers I've ever spoken to. Uh, I recently finished reading his book, which takes a really unique approach uh, to coaching athletes, whether it be individual sports or team sports. A lot of really good information uh, with the expert generalist approach, where we're going to look at the entire athlete and all facets. So a really interesting show lined up for you. Uh, I think there'll be some great information that you can apply immediately to yourself or to your team. Uh, again, this is episode number nine. So all the show notes, links, and sound bites can be found at trainwithzan.com forward slash zero zero nine. And as a reminder, I always want to remind you while you're there to enter your email address and sign up for the email newsletter so that you don't miss out when new podcasts, videos, and articles are released. And I look forward to diving into today's episode with you. And I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Let's, let's get this party started in three, two, one. All right, guys, welcome back to the Train with Zan podcast. Really proud to have today's guest on. Uh, this guy is a nat naturopathic doctor. He leads Canada Basketball Performance Nutrition Program. He's also a certified strength and conditioning specialist. Uh, he has a ton of other letters behind his name, which I'll let him dive into a little bit deeper. Uh, but he's also very well known on the international speaking tour. He has his own podcast called the Dr. Bub's Performance Podcast. Uh, he consults with teams in the NBA, NFL, NHL, uh, in MLB, um, as well as he's the author of a recently released book titled peak, the new science of athletic performance that is revolutionizing sports. And that's the reason we're really having him on today is to discuss his new book. I just got finished reading it and really enjoyed it and learned a lot. Uh, so excited to have Dr. Mark Bubbs on the show. Zan, appreciate you having me on and uh, taking the time. Well, thanks for coming on. Obviously, you've got a lot going on just, just reading your brief bio. Uh, there were a lot more things we could have fit in there, but we didn't. Um, I, I know, I'll be honest, I got a little bit anxious before I had to introduce you because there are so many things on your resume that I'm positive I left some important ones out. Would you mind just go ahead and giving us a little bit of your background and kind of uh, tell us how, how you came to be where you are now? Uh, no worries at all, Sam. I mean, you, you hit all the major points, which is great. And you know, for me, I grew up like most people probably listening into the podcast, playing loads of sports. You know, baseball was the first passion and then got into to basketball as I, a bit more as I moved through high school and university. And, and you know, during that time for me, I, I started getting run down and sick and just couldn't, you know, while I was trying to add some lean muscle and, you know, natural sort of ectomorph lanky six foot kid at 14 trying to add some weight on and all of a sudden getting run down and, and always sick. And this is where I was like, geez, what the, what the heck's going on? And you know, got a little bit of help from the uh, from uh, the doctors in the area, but it wasn't until someone had touched on my nutrition, and this is going back 20 years when it was a little bit more uncommon to be diving into into the nutrition side of things. And all of a sudden, you know, like a like flipping a switch, wasn't getting sick anymore, was adding the weight nicely, and felt great. And for me, that was the first big cue to say, okay, I think there's something we can do here in terms of really helping people out from a on a health side with with how you eat and how you train and th you know sleep and all those lifestyle factors and of course you know even on, a, on an athlete side of things in terms of supporting you know high level athletes and it's been pretty cool to see over the last couple of decades how that's really moved into the elite space of just really treating the whole the whole athlete and thinking the athlete as a as a person first right yeah well you know and, and that's really that was i thought the most important of the feature that stood out the most about your book is is treating athletes or people 
it's entirely and completely. I feel like um, in today's world, everything is so specialized. You know, what professional athletes especially, but even even more younger amateur guys now, they might have somebody that helps them out with their nutrition. Some they might have a strength training coach. They might have a speed coach. They might have uh, you know a sports specific coach. Um, but but really, that's not the majority of people. I mean, most people just can't afford to hire all these people unless you're an elite athlete and you're a professional or you're an Olympic type athlete. Um, so what happens is, you know, the athlete themselves or the parent, I believe, really becomes in charge of a lot of things and wears a lot of different hats. Like you said, they're the nutritionist, they're the strength training coach, they're the ones that's uh, trying to monitor rest and recovery and sleep. Um, and it becomes uh, a lot to do. And you have to be very well versed in a lot of things, which is kind of the theme of your book. Uh, your book talks about being an expert generalist. And I'd like for you to explain that, you know, to the listeners and, and kind of tell what, tell them what an expert generalist is. Yeah. And that's a great point, Zan, in terms of, you know, on, on younger teams, younger athletes or high school, even college and semi-pro teams, you've got, um, sports science staff who are, you know, maybe there's a strength and conditioning coach who's taking care of all these different domains of, of therapy and training and nutrition. And so they're having to really expand the breadth of their knowledge, right? How many different things they know. And even teams more at the elite level with all these different specialists, like you mentioned, we're seeing now that if the specialists can all understand what the others are doing and communicate with a more of a common language, then we start to see some better outcomes. And so, you know, the idea of of expert generalism is that, you know, typically, obviously we're always going to need specialists. The, the last century, you know, the 20th century, we've got these incredible advancements. You think of the, you know, the automobile, air travel, antibiotics, I mean, and the internet, the list goes on and on. But, you know, if we use even healthcare as sort of an example, you know, we used to suffer greatly from infectious diseases. So all the specialists and antibiotics and vaccines have been tremendous in that. But today, you know, more people now die of, of chronic conditions, right? So your obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. And we're trying to fix those things by having more and more subspecializations when really what we need is, you know, more general knowledge. And this is something that's actually been gaining momentum in the medical field. So recently, you know, the Journal of the Association of American Medical Colleges, they released a paper called The Expert Generalist, A Contradiction Whose Time Has Come. And this basically highlighting how the practitioners, the docs who had a wider knowledge base, so the doctors who knew a little bit about nutrition and they knew enough about exercise and, and the importance of sleep, they were the ones who were achieving better outcomes with their with their patients. And so, you know, from a athletic standpoint, this is something that we see as well. And you know, David Epstein's new book, Range, just kind of highlights this tremendously in the, in the opening uh, section there when he talks about Tiger Woods' development. Because, you know, Tiger Woods was obviously a model of early specialization. He was in a sport like golf where actually early specialization is pretty, you know, pretty important really. Um, but he compares and contrasts that with a guy like Roger Federer, right, who's equally legendary in what he's accomplished and how he had more of a model of generalization, right? He played lots of different sports growing up. Um, and he makes the argument that having that more generalist approach to sport and playing lots of different sports before you specialize is a, is a better way to go about it. And, you know, that would be something that I think we see now in the strength and conditioning space of, of coaches wanting athletes to play lots of different sports because that develops all the different um, physical attributes that they're looking for. And so you see that idea of expert generalism on the development side. And then again, in terms of the performance staff, of again, being able to talk the same language, trying to connect some of these dots between, you know, if you're stuck in your silo as a therapist or nutritionist and you're, you're only seeing the problem through your own lens and you, and you can't take that uh, other person's or third party point of view, then you're, you know, you're going to, tend to be st stuck with some of these more complex problems. Yeah, well, I'm really glad you brought that up because I'll be completely honest. After I read your book, uh, I had seen David Epstein's book on Amazon. It's one of those, it kept popping up on my cart. After I read your book about, you know, being a general, uh, general ex an expert generalist, uh, I decided, man, I, I got to learn more about this. So I picked up his and read it and also found it very interesting. Um, and just for all the listeners, I'll make sure to link to your book below so everybody can find it quickly. Um, I'll, I'll definitely recommend it a number of times throughout the episode because uh, it was phenomenal. But but yeah, so his, his book, it hit on a lot of the same topics as yours. 
yours. Um, I think it even you know, spoke about that, uh, that medical paper as well, where people that are having more success, th- th- they have a broader reach. M- maybe their understanding isn't quite as deep in some areas. Uh, maybe they have one area of expertise and they have a number of areas where they're uh, competent. Um, and I, I thought that really relates to sports. It, it relates to a lot of things, uh, but it definitely relates to the sports as well. And I know in your book, a few times you've referenced, uh, and I've seen it firsthand, whether it be in you know college athletics or professional baseball, where everybody's not on the same page. Maybe the strength coach isn't on the same page as the coaching staff, uh, and maybe they're not on the same page as the trainer. So you have all these different people pulling you different directions. Maybe your coaching staff is, is pushing you to go out and practice longer, where your strength coach may Maybe, he, maybe you have a tough day in the weight room or the gym with him, um, and, and that there's not great communication between the training or medical staff as well. There, there's just a miscommunication. There's so many things that can go on. So I think the, the more well-informed you can be about all the areas, uh, the better success rate you'll see. Yeah, because, I mean, it's easy for any of us to get, you know, if you're a strength coach, you typically will fall into the pattern of thinking, well, I need to get my guy stronger to to validate my position and to validate I can be efficacious with these athletes. And, you know, depending on the athlete, maybe they don't need to get any stronger, you know, maybe. And that's just as you mentioned, being on the same page with the whole performance staff of saying, hey, here's our overarching plans for these players and this player and, and where we want to go is it's just so important, right? Because at the end of the day, yeah, everyone's got to be uh, rowing the boat in the same direction. Yep, absolutely. Now, and that kind of really rolls right into, I'd say, the overarching theme of your book, you know, which, which is to be a great athlete, you have to be healthy first. Uh, you know, guys are getting sick all the time. That's going to impact their performance. Guys who aren't recovering, guys who aren't getting enough sleep. Um, if you're not healthy, it's going to be really difficult to, you know, have elite athletic performance. Um, so, so again, I, I would say that was one of the overarching themes of your book. But I'd love for you to kind of go into a little bit more depth and kind of tell us your thoughts about how you think just being a healthy person, um, you know, impacts the athletic performance. Yeah, that's definitely something that's, it's great to see the, the focus on that, um, today compared to even a decade ago. And of course you got real, you know, renowned experts around the world, like, uh, Dr. Michael Gleason from Leftbury university, who's an expert in exercise immunology. And, you know, he had a statement saying that there's now convincing evidence that, you know, increased training load, increased competition load, psychological stress, all the travel that athletes go through, you know, all these things are big risk factors for illness in, in high level athletes. And you don't even actually have to be sick. You don't have to have an actual infection, right? Even upper respiratory symptoms. So a guy named Dr. Neil Walsh, who's out at uh, Bangor University, done a lot of work in this. Even the symptoms will predict poor performance. And so if you've got an athlete who's you know, tired and run down and has the scratchy throat and, you know, is, is sort of dragging their heels a lot, then that's definitely going to be something that's going to impact their performance, not only acutely, but really when you're thinking that long term, because if you're in a team sport, you got a long season. We know that at the end of seasons, whether you're playing basketball, ice hockey, you know, football, baseball, that's when athletes are getting run down and, and more exposed to injury or their performance will start to dip. So whatever we can do, and you see it again across all these different performance staffs of, of, of really emphasizing the fundamentals, you know, those un, those unsexy things that, that don't uh, really get the headlines in the, on social media or whatnot. But, um, you know, those are the ones that when you layer those down, uh, become so important. And, you know, even in the book and the immunity chapter, we talk about hand washing of all things, which, you know, you wouldn't really think of that, would you, in terms of having a heavy emphasis. But, you know, you can reduce infection rates by, you know, 30, 40% just by making sure guys are, are washing their hands frequently through the day. And it's, again, whether it's handing out Purells or, you know, support staff kind of emphasizing that, but you can see even in the recent NBA playoffs, you know, you get a couple guys sick at the wrong time of year that can cost you a game at that, the worst possible time. So I think that's where, you know, definitely, you know, the mantra now is that elite performance really is incompatible with frequent illness. So we got to make sure that we're keeping our athletes uh, healthy and in the gym so they can keep their training, get consistent with, with getting the sessions in and obviously being on the playing field. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Now you actually beat me to the punch because I was going to bring it up later in the show. But that's one of the things since I read your book that I started applying myself is the hand washing. Uh, after I read that article, 
I thought, you know what, that, that makes perfect sense. Like if I want to be healthy, if I want to train hard, uh, and I just want to, you know, be in good health, I need to wash my hands more often. So I went to, I went to the store and I bought three Purell's. I keep one in my truck. I keep one in my bathroom and I keep one at my desk. So now before I'd probably wash my hands sporadically throughout the day. Now I bet I wash them at least four or five times more often just cause I have, you know, a Purell or an antibacterial soap, uh, right in front of me. So that was one of the things that that I immediately took away from your book. Uh, there, there's a lot of takeaways that people can can, can use, but that was one that I, I thought it was funny. You went ahead and mentioned that already. Well, and Zen, I mean, that's one. I've got three kids under five at home, and I'll tell you, anybody who has little kids at home, if you want to put this theory to the test, you know, colds and flus go around the house like like nobody's business, right? But if you start doing the hand washing frequently, you will be one of the few parents in the class who's not getting sick every month. You know, it is it is really phenomenal. So yeah, appreciate that. Yeah, no, no problem at all. Like I said, there were a lot of topics and j- just so people kind of know, I, n- I know I've kind of been very basic or very vague about it. A lot of the topics that you cover in the book are related to health, but they're, they're very specific topics. Some of them are related to uh, controlling our blood sugar, uh, maintaining a, a sleep balance with circadian rhythms, uh, the microbiome, adjusting that. Uh, keeping keeping your hands clean and working with the immune system. So there there are a lot of of major topics. Um, if you had to pick out a couple of them, what would you say are a few of the most important things that athletes who are trying to you know maintain healthy lifestyles? What are a few things that they should really try to highlight? Well, I mean, then there's a couple of fronts here, and if we if we stay on the athlete health side of things, and this maybe this extends more to even um, coaches practitioners as well, because you know, we know if you're not getting enough sleep and athletes don't tend to get enough sleep. So we've got studies out of South Africa showing that 75% of the national level athletes didn't get even eight hours of sleep per night. Uh, we see research on Olympic level athletes. So when they're compared to age and sex match controls, you know, they have poor sleep quality, right? Typically due to the intense training is what they think and also more fragmented sleep. So, you know, when you're sleep, when you're not getting enough sleep, that's going to start to impair recovery. And it also starts to throw off things like blood glucose control. You know, so your blood sugar levels tend to be higher in terms of the fasting levels. And that's one where if you're a coach or a practitioner, it can be a little red flag for being, you know, kind of ru- t- tired, run down, whatnot. Um, because oftentimes, you know, coaches or <laughs> trainers, you know, working early in the morning, late at night, not getting enough sleep. And so that can be a big one that's going to start to impact health on that front because we know that if you're even in the, you know, we've got the bigger normal ranges for things like fasting glucose. And if you're in the upper uh, quartile, so the top 25%, then you're actually at a 40% greater risk of things like cardiovascular disease. And that actually occurs in a dose-dependent manner. So we see these long, you know, 30-plus year observational studies where it's like, the higher your blood glucose, then the more, the greater your risk of some of these events. So that's more maybe on the coach side of things. Um, from the player standpoint, you know, there's two key factors here that we we keep reiterating in the book, and one of them is obviously the fundamentals. And this is where, as a as an athlete, laying down the fundamentals of your nutrition is really the biggest bucket, right? That's 80% of getting you to where you want to go. And so, you know, achieving the protein intake that you need overall, you know, typically that where we're aiming for in the book, 1.6 grams per kilogram per day is sort of that minimum dose to really um, support. And it can go all the way up to 2.2, which is, you know, roughly a gram per pound. But when we actually look in the part of the book, we go over the research of, you know, in professional soccer and rugby and how 20 years ago it was guys weren't getting enough protein in. These days, most athletes have heard that mantra for, you know, for a while now. And so when you look at athletes, the protein intake side of the equation is actually looking pretty good. So they're typically getting more than the 1.6. But when you dive into the total energy needs or the total amount of carbohydrates that are going in, sometimes there's going to be gaps in in those buckets. And so th- those are important ones to to achieve that minimum amount. And then in a sport like baseball, Zan, this is where, you know, depending on a guy's body composition, you can actually start to start periodize the nutrition a little bit right? Every meal doesn't need to be a, a higher carb meal, right? And so this is where, you know, if if meals are always higher in energy and carbohydrate and your athlete is holding on to too much body weight, we know that blood sugars will tend to be higher. We know that inflammatory status will tend to be higher. And, uh, you know, the, the higher your level as an athlete, the more travel that you do, especially air travel, that's going to be a big stressor as well. So, you know, 
establishing the fundamentals is always job one. But then within that, because you'll often have athletes say, well, I have a healthy diet and, and that's great that they, you know, that's the first bench pose. But after that, you've got to really start tinkering a little more and personalizing things to that to individual athlete. Yeah, that's one thing I've noticed. I speak to a lot of people and they say, hey, Zana, you know, I'm eating healthy. Uh, you know, I, I'm not getting the results I want. What do you think? And I say, well, what do you eat? Oh, well, I eat really healthy. You know, I have a salad or I have some chicken at times. And, well, how, you know, how much ever do you eat? And do you know how many carbohydrates? Do you know how, many, how much protein, your, your caloric intake? And I, I would say most people, I, I, I'm not a proponent of you have to track every single calorie that goes in your mouth forever. But I think it's a very valuable tool for a lot of people um, to at some point keep a food log or a food journal for a week or two weeks to try to really get an understanding of what's going in their mouths. Because just like you said, I, I think most people know the difference between healthy and unhealthy. Most people know that getting a grilled chicken breast is much better than going to a fast food restaurant and getting a burger and fries. Um, but when you try to dive a little bit deeper than that, th there's a lot of different shades of healthy. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a spectrum. Um, and I think a lot of people aren't really aware of exactly where they lie on that spectrum. Yeah, you're exactly right, Zan. And it's, it's a bit like building your skills up in, in basketball or baseball or golf when you, you know, you get some skills and you get to a certain level and there's always, you know, there's always more skills to be added. There's always another level to get to. And, and, you know, if you're trying to separate yourself from the field, I mean, this is one that I always tell our athletes at Canada basketball is that, you know, most of the baseball players out there are going to be working their tails off on all the skills aspect, which is important and in the gym. So where can you find some of these areas to separate yourself? And nutrition is not just about getting you bigger and stronger. It can certainly do that, but it's really about, you know, that recovery aspect. If you can show up day in, day out and be able to perform, um, and actually a trainer here in, in Canada, Scott Livingston, sort of a renowned strength coach, worked in the NHL for years, talks about how he, he would rather have a guy be able to give 90%, 100% of the time than some guys who give you a hundred percent, only 60% of the time. Right. So again, that notion of consistency being so crucial in this whole story of performance. Yeah, that's a great analogy. I've, I've heard that before. And I think I remember reading that. That's uh, it's absolutely true. And I can tell you, you know, anecdotally from my own experience when I've been through times of highs and lows and also as a coach, uh, you know, you want guys that are the steady Eddie, so to speak, the guys that show up every day, even if they're not the most talented person, uh, but you, you, you know what kind of effort you're going to get, you know what kind of outcome you're going to get, uh, and you have a predictable um, routine or, or outcome you can get from these guys, it makes it makes the whole process of, of coaching and working with the team uh, much much easier and much more uh, much more easy to tailor to your specific needs. So I'm glad you brought that up. Now, one of the sections in your book, you have a couple of different sections about nutrition, and you know we could talk about nutrition all day long, uh, and I'm sure we'll stay on it for a while. But there are some differences between uh, you know sports performance nutrition and body composition nutrition. Uh, so I, I'd love for you to kind of dive into that a little bit and kind of highlight a few of the main differences, uh, you know, f between the guys that are really trying to get the most out of their bodies on a field. And again, there's a lot of different athletes, whether it be endurance athletes or strength athletes. Um, and, and then we have the other guys on the other end of the spectrum who are in weight-controlled sports, whether it be bodybuilding or wrestling uh, or powerlifting. Um, you, you know, but th they're trying to control their body composition a little bit more. So if you don't mind, I'd love for you to highlight some of the differences between maybe uh, nutrition for sports performance and nutrition for body composition. Yeah, this is a really uh, fascinating aspect because naturally we always like to think that the athlete who's the leanest and the most ripped is going to be the one that performs the best. And, you know, I kick off chapter four is where we talk about body composition, hypertrophy, and even some of the weight making sports. And it opens with a story about Phil Kessel, who's an NHL player, used to play for the Toronto Maple Leafs, was the captain, you know, perennial all-star. And, you know, he didn't have the look of a, of an elite athlete. He was, looked a little bit overweight. You know, they had a young squad coming in. He was sort of uh, meant to be showing them the ropes and how to how to perform. And, and over the summer, he was actually at a charity golf tournament, and he had a picture of him in a hot dog. And the you know, even in the middle of summer in Toronto, it's nothing but ice hockey in the first four pages of the sports section. And they had they had this big thing talking about big articles, talking about how Phil's just not a good role model. He's not uh, – this isn't the kind of captain we want, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the irony was, you know, if you, if you actually looked at the metrics, I mean, Phil Kessel would test as one of the, if not the fastest, if one of the, if not the strongest – and missed the fewest games due to injury. 
so the question was, well, does it really matter if he's 13% body fat versus 8% body fat? Because, you know, if you're the strongest and the fastest and you don't miss games and you're a great player, I mean, I'm not sure what else there, there yeah, is. There's a not metric, a whole lot right? else to uh, put on that list. And, and so sometimes we get a little bit too enamored. And this was actually, you know, for any kind of boxing fans out there, obviously the recent fight between Ruiz and Joshua at uh, Madison Square Garden, you know, you got Joshua who looks great, looks lean, looks like a, you know, a real heavyweight. And then you've got Ruiz, who's a highly skilled boxer, but looked 20, 30 pounds overweight. And he outboxed him. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, these are, you know, in skill sports, the skill's going to win out. And um, and so that's one of the, the pieces there of always just knowing what your metrics are. So you're, you know, you, you've got to be outcome based. You know, it still matters how your player's performing over how they're sort of looking more or less. But then on the other end of the spectrum, you still have lots of athletes who would play better if they were leaner, right? Who would play, um, be less prone to even things like uh, infection, injury, perhaps if they were in better shape. And so that's where, you know, that notion of being able to start to periodize your nutrition. And so rather than always having, you know, every day of the week is a, is a high carb breakfast, then there might be some days of the week where you're having a higher fat, higher protein, lower carb breakfast. And so you start to look at where athletes are putting their you know, when they're training in the day, whether it's lifting or whether it's their skill-based training, and start to prioritize carbohydrates around the training. And of course, the more intense the training, then the more carbohydrates there can be on board. And, you know, it's going to be individual to the uh, to the athlete. The general recommendations for team sport athletes in terms of carbohydrates is going to be four to seven grams per kilogram. But even within that, I mean, if you're 100, if you weigh 100 kilograms, so 220, 220 pounds, you know, do you eat 400 grams of carbs or do you eat 700? You know, that's a pretty big, yeah, it's a big window. It's a, it's a big old window. And so this is where, you know, a little bit of tinkering, a little bit of support from, you know, the team performance nutritionist or dietitian, it can be really important to be able to, to not only help with getting the athlete leaner, but typically if they're going to be more overweight, you're going to make the athlete healthier as well, right? Better blood sugar control, better inflammatory control, more than likely going to have less games missed due to things like infection and upper respiratory tract infection, et cetera. And so, you know, this is where all these kind of loops start to, to feed back on one another in terms of that idea of having a, you know, a healthy athlete first. Yeah, sure. You know, it's funny the NFL draft was not too long ago and every year the the draft rolls around, there's always the pictures of Tom Brady uh, and the videos of Tom Brady, you know, before he got drafted and, and basically how he looked, uh, not, not super impressive, but what he's ended up being obviously is one of the best players of all time. Uh, so it's really interesting. I thought that, that story in your book really correlated to that, that yeah, it's not always about how you look. I know personally from, from kind of tinking around in the bodybuilding world that sometimes when you look, you look your best, so to speak, I, I'm making air quotes right now. When you're your leanest, uh, you, you're run down, you're tired, your hormones might be suppressed. You don't feel great. But if you have a little bit of extra, uh, meat on the bones, uh, per se, sometimes the performance is better. You have more energy. You're able to, uh, you, you sleep better. You have better workouts. Um, so it's a very interesting topic and I, I feel like there's, there's definitely a balance, you know, C can you be, really overweight and perform your best probably not uh can you be too lean i think you probably can i think it's about finding that sweet spot and, and ultimately like you said it's about working with people uh who, who are there to support your goals and, and help you uh figure out a really good plan and, and that's where i think someone can benefit from reading your book because most of the people again i know olympic athletes and professional athletes most of these guys hire teams around them they hire nutritionists in the off season they have team uh, nutritionists and trainers and doctors and strength coaches. But for the majority of athletes, whether it be uh, somebody who's, you know, reliving their glory days and they like to go to the gym and they're just trying to be uh, in, in great shape, or maybe they compete in a physique sport, or maybe it's a high school athlete, which is a very large group of athletes, uh, you're in charge of all this stuff yourself. And, and that's where I think really having a good knowledge on a lot of different areas can really help you. Um, and so like, again, I'm gonna plug your book a number of times cause that's what we're talking about. And, and, <laughs> Appreciate and, it. Well, but, but, but that's why I have you here. Cause I thought it was so great and there's tons of resources in it. Um, uh, and it covers a lot of different topics. So, so people can kind of start to somewhat become their own coach. And I, I think that's ultimately the goal uh, for, for me, you know, as a baseball coach, a lot of times we say, hey, the best players are their own coach. They're able to monitor themselves. They're able to evaluate what's going on and have that body awareness. 
A hundred percent. Yeah, I totally agree. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why we give all the, we connect folks with all the experts and the researchers on the front lines doing the work so that they can go and, and read more and dig into it further if they want to. Because yeah, as, as soon as, if you can give someone those skills, then, you know, that makes a huge difference for them to not be able to navigate, you know, as they go through a season, whether they're playing at university or high school, whatever it might be, right? Absolutely. Which kind of brings me into one of the next topics. That's a good segue. Uh, one of the topics you talked about in your book was called halftime nutritional strategies. And you have some stories and, and some some references along with that. But if you wouldn't mind, uh, I know you'll do a much job, better job explaining it than I will. So let's kind of hear your take on the halftime nutritional strategies. This is, yeah, this is a really new area of research. And, uh, you know, an expert named uh, Dr. Mark Russell from the UK, leads Trinity University, has done a lot of work in this in the last decade. And interestingly, he was actually studying skill performance in young soccer players and how having a sport drink, a glucose drink would impact, you know, skill over the course of a game. And what they actually started noticing was that these kids were starting to have these bouts of hypoglycemia, you know, in the first half and after the, after halftime. And so that was really curious for them. They said, geez, what the heck's going on here? And they, they actually found that if you were consuming, you know, a higher glycemic index carb, so some, you know, a sport drink an hour before you were started the, starting the game, you were actually going to see lower levels of blood glucose, you know, 15 to 30 minutes after the start of, of exercise, which is, which is a problem, right? This is where teams start out slow in the first half or start out slow coming out of halftime. Um, baseball in particular, you know, you've got these breaks, you know, between innings and depending how long they can be, this can impact as well. And and interestingly, I mean, even they found even if you were consuming this drink within 30 minutes of starting exercise, you could still elicit this similar response. And so, you know, that's that kicked off s some work around, you know, what are some options? And so a lady named uh, Emma Stevenson, she's over at the Newcastle University. They did a really interesting study where they compared maltodextrin. So that's your classic, you know, high glycemic sugar that you'll find in, in most sports drinks against honey. You know your natural honey that you'd uh, you know get at the shop and end up placebo, and so these soccer players were basically sipping on this drink, about an eight percent carb electrolyte drink over the course of a two hour soccer game, and so you say okay well what happened between this high glycemic, you know typical sport drink group and with this other group having the honey and it was pretty interesting because the group that had the honey were able to maintain their glucose levels or blood sugar levels. They were able to maintain them about 13 to 15 percent higher at the end of the game, and that might not sound like much, but typically glucose levels will be dropping as you get to the end of games. And in soccer, the last 15 minutes is when all the goals are scored, <laughs> even at the highest level. So that again can be the difference between winning and losing. And they also found that you know typically you'd have this this big drop after halftime with a regular sport drink, but when you adopted this um, honey-based drink. You know, rather than having like a 20% drop in blood glucose, you'd only have a 4% drop. And so some take-homes here for coaches and athletes is that if you're going to have your sport drink, you want to really have it as soon as you start playing in the game, as soon as the athletes are actually training versus having it an hour before in the car on the way to the game or an hour and a half before when you're on the team bus, right? Another take-home is that during the actual game, Depending on the player, you just want to watch they don't start over-consuming the sport drink because that can, again, lead to these drops um, in glucose levels once you get into something like a halftime where your athlete's now going to sit for 15 or 20 minutes or longer depending on the sport. And so I think that's one that you know, the experts were even surprised around the fact that these types of things are happening at an individual level. And and it's a conversation. You know, If you're a coach and you see an athlete that sort of starts a, a game or a half slowly or you know often has these little dips, then that might be an area to, to start to dig into. Well, that was one that really resonated with me because, you know, with my background in baseball, uh, I, I think back to, you know, a typical baseball day starts about four hours before the game. So if you have a game at 7 o'clock at night, your day usually starts around 3 in the afternoon. Uh, and that means getting on the field about two hours before, whether it be stretching and throwing or batting practice, you know, whatever your schedule is. But there's there's almost always water and Gatorade in the dugout. And what do you think everybody drinks? Everybody drinks the Gatorade because it tastes better. Um, <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, and that's what I thought. I was like, man, for all these years, we've been giving, giving players or, or allowing them access to Gatorade. 
when they probably should be drinking water until the game starts. Uh, and so that was another takeaway that I thought, man, I'm going to try to start implementing that with the teams that I work with uh, now immediately is you, you probably don't need that Gatorade or Powerade or, or sugary sport drink before. Um, but once the game starts, you know, then it's a different ball game. So again, just a, another really neat takeaway. We, we talked about blood sugar. I know we talk about blood sugar a lot and you bring it up in your book a lot, um, but it impacts a lot. I, you know, it impacts your performance impre- impacts your cognitive function. Uh, and it's something that a lot of people should be paying attention to. So with that said, I do want to bounce around a little bit, you know. Well, Zen, I'll just make one more point there yeah, if I sure. can jump in. I mean, you know, the research on even there's a couple other techniques. Like carb mouth rinsing is another technique where you literally just, you know, having the Gatorade and then spitting it out, which sounds funny because you haven't swallowed it, but that triggers a, an effect to the brain, which gives your nervous system a stimulus, um, and you do get a performance out, output from that. So that can be kind of an option. You, if anybody was watching the World Cup, the last soccer World Cup, you saw a lot of the guys kind of swishing and then spitting all over the field. Um, so that's an interesting one that that athletes can try as well. And then. You know, the last one here would be around caffeinated chewing gum, which I find pretty fascinating because, you know, I'm a big coffee guy. I love coffee. But in baseball, if you're if you're coming off the bench and you don't know when you're coming in the game, I mean, having that coffee before the game, you don't know when it's, you know, it peaks about 45 to 60 minutes in your bloodstream after you've taken it in. And you don't know when you're coming on the field. You don't know when you're coming in from the dug, from the uh, from the bullpen to pitch. And so caffeinated chewing gum gets taken up really quickly uh, in the oral mucosa. So it'll kick in in like 10 to 15 minutes. So that can be a great strategy for players who, you know, manager comes over, taps you on the shoulder, you're in the game. You know, that's when you can then have that strategy ready so that if you feel like you need a bit of a boost, then you're, you know, you're off and running. Yeah. So I'll have to admit, I'm a little bit of a caffeine addict. I uh, I drink way too much <laughs> caffeine. I drink more than I should. Um, so when I read that in your book, talking about the caffeine gum, I thought, man, I got to get some of that. And uh, then I, I thought about it. I was like, I'm, that's probably not for me. I'm not playing sports anymore. I'm not the athlete uh, on the field that needs that caffeine boost uh, or needs the uh, androgenic uh, aid. So uh, definitely yeah, exactly. a, a, the gr- same way. <laughs> a great idea for a lot of people, not so much for me. But I thought that was another really, really interesting uh, thing you spoke about. Um, but yeah, so I, I did want to ask you about, you know, we talk about the blood glucose a lot. Um, do you rec- do you recommend players uh, or athletes, you know, buying a glucose monitoring system or a finger prick system where they can monitor their own glucose? Is that something you think people should do? Well, I think, you know, for a lot of athletes that still might be maybe a step too far. I mean, I think it's important for training staff, uh, medical staff, nutritionists to just be keeping an eye on on where in the normal range a player is. So, you know, we have metrics like HA1C, which is a three-month average of glucose, uh, things like fasting glucose. Um, so if you do see a player who's struggling, you know, it always comes back to this, you know, where a uh, needs analysis, you know, wh- where is the player at? What are the things they need to improve on? If an athlete is struggling with recovery, if they're frequently getting sick, if they're struggling with maintaining their energy, then this idea of, you know, it doesn't have to be a pathology, but they could still be struggling with ups and downs with glucose throughout the day. So that's where even, you know, if they do have support with the medical staff, I mean, a continuous glucose monitor is really a great way to get a snapshot of of what's going on throughout the day and how people respond to to their meals. Because, you know, a healthy quote unquote meal of you know, oats in the morning with some berries and maybe some maple syrup or something can really send, for some people, send their blood glucose through the roof. And, and that's where you can maybe start to pick out some of these uh, these gaps or these problem areas in an athlete's diet. Yeah. You know, for me, again, I think one of the big keys here is that people are specific and deliberate about the information they're trying to get. You know, I think we talked about earlier, there's a big difference between, you know, being healthy or being high carb or low carb, and then really paying attention, you know, to how that affects you know, your blood glucose level. Um, so, so I'm all for people using the most advanced techniques, you, you know, they can within reason. I don't, nothing invasive. And that's why I wanted to ask you about the blood glucose monitoring system. Um, I, I just think it's interesting. I know some athletes maybe monitor it more than, than others. Um, obviously for sure. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, like you said, there's, and if, if an athlete's keen on doing it, maybe in the off season with their nutritionist or strength coach, they could do it for a period to kind of see what's going on. Like that type of thing's fine. You just don't want athletes to get too uh stressed out about uh, you know one or two measures that come back higher you know yep absolutely 
Well, th- that's interesting. And like I said, there's a, man, a lot of nutritional strategies that we could talk about, but uh, j- just for the sake of time, I do want to try to talk about a number of different topics that are covered in your book. And you hit on it briefly earlier, talking about sleep and recovery. Um, we've kind of that's come up a few different times. Uh, you know, recovery seems to me it seems like a buzzword lately. Most uh, there's a lot more attention being paid to athletes' recovery, whether that be their training volume uh, or, or you know competition season, uh, number of athletic competitions. Uh, and there's a lot of different you know gizmos, gadgets slash techniques for people who say they can help you recover better, whether it be uh, a tens unit or some sort of a you know electro. Uh, uh, muscle uh i've lost the word in my mind uh, you know an electric electro stems yeah electro stems yeah electro stems or the vibration therapy guns or the cryotherapy uh For sure. or, or ice baths you know and you hit on a couple of those in the book i know you speak about the cryotherapy and the ice baths and i've, I've read a few other things uh about some of those you know different methods but i'd love to hear your thoughts on some of the recovery methods that are out there maybe what works and maybe which ones uh don't work or overhyped yeah, again, like you said, recovery in the last decade, the, the science has really exploded. There's experts like Dr. Shona Halson out in Australia who've done a lot of work in this. And, you know, I talked with some sports science directors as well, guys like Lachlan Penfold, who used to be with the uh, the director for the Golden State Warriors. And, you know, the first place to start with recovery is always going to be, you know, nutrition, sleep, and even things like mental emotional stress, you know, somebody's life in terms of what's going on in the rest of their life. You know, those are the big rocks, the training plan. You know, Lachlan always talk about how if you if you don't have your training plan right, then these modalities like the stim or the ice baths aren't gonna really move the needle too much. So that being said, you know, always have those fundamentals in place. But absolutely in the book, we talk about kind of the, the upper portion of that recovery pyramid and some of these different techniques you can use. And and it's interesting because things like ice baths have been around for you know, forever. And, you know, I always remember seeing the fridge Perry, you know, back in the day with the bears sitting in his big ice tub in the, the, um, you know, in training camp. And the interesting thing, when you look at it, experts like in Australia, a guy named Jonathan Peake, they do the, you know, these reviews to figure out how some of these things work. And we still don't really know how, um, ice baths, cold water immersion actually works because it doesn't actually lower inflammation compared to something like active recovery. And so, you know, how does it do it? Well, again, even the top experts aren't really sure. It could have something to do with redistributing blood flow, um, a cool, a localized cooling effect, uh, you know, a pain relieving effect. But we do see that they can definitely reduce muscle soreness, you know, up to even four days after training. They can, you know, an ice bath can lower or buffer reductions that you might have in muscular power. So those fast twitch fibers, which are really key, you know, in most sports. And so, you know, ice baths are definitely superior to to just passive rest and typically what you're looking for is about 11 to 15 minutes right in the in the bath and at a temperature of about 59 fahrenheit so that's always the the tricky part is to get guys in there for that long to be able to elicit that effect and you know that's where maybe we see now the the growth of things like cryotherapy which as you mentioned you know a lot of buzz around that and sort of has that exotic feel to it you standing in a in a tub you know at temperatures ridiculous temperatures minus 176 to minus 300 fahrenheit Um, but the funny thing is even at that temperature your core temperature ends up being the same as it would do in an ice bath right and that's it seems counterintuitive but you know air obviously doesn't have the same conductivity as water and so you know cryotherapy makes your skin a heck of a lot cooler Uh, that tends to come back after about 60 minutes or so and uh, overall, cryotherapy has been, you know, shown in some studies, but but not all. It's pretty equivocal of, of being able to reduce muscle damage and muscle soreness. But recently, these things have been looked at head to head, right? So ice baths versus cryo, you know, which is better? And when the, you know, at the end of the day, results coming out, we see that actually it's the ice baths that re- that result in, you know, lower levels of muscle soreness which is key in terms of that consistency and being able to repeat your performance, reduce markers of muscle damage. So things like creatinine kinase that you'd pick up on a blood test, you know, less of a drop in the exercise induced reduction in your muscular power. So you're, you're buffering that natural drop that you get in power from, you know, heavy days of lifting or or competition. 
and maybe most most important one is a, a higher perception of recovery. So the athlete's actual um, perception of what's going on is better with the ice bath. And you know, the irony of, of all this is that that said, you still have to. It's tough to get guys and gals to get in the ice tub for eleven or fifteen minutes. And so you do see a lot of elite and professional performance teams with the cryo because athletes are just more prone to even doing that sometimes. And so, um, you know, maybe the last point I'll make is that when you talk to these experts again, you say, okay, well, which is better? Is it the ice? Is it the cryo? Is it even a hot bath? And a lot of them now will just let the athlete pick. And you say, well, geez, how come, you know, why would you let the athlete pick? And basically the, when you give the choice to the athlete, the athlete's way more likely to do it in the long run, right? They become more consistent at it. And so I thought that was really fascinating as well. And that there's these little differences between them, but at the end of the day, whatever one the athletes more likely to keep doing is probably going to be the best one for them in the long term. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, I think that's true for a lot of nutritional strategies or workout programs, you know, whatever you can do to have the most adherence or become the most consistent with, uh, will be the best, you know, on an individual basis. So interesting. Now I, I do want to ask you about this cause this is something I'm a little confused about and I feel like uh, some other people and other listeners might be as well. Um, you know, when we talk about the ice baths and we talk about reducing inflammation and, and these topics, when, when we go in the weight room and we train and we have muscle damage uh, or micro trauma or whatever term we want to use it, uh, I've heard things before that saying you don't want to reduce inflammation because the inflammation process is what helps rebuild the muscle bigger and stronger. That's why you don't want to use products like ibuprofen uh, post-training. Um, and then you hear the other side of it where it's, uh, you know, getting in an ice bath is, is good for you. Um, I'm not sure if the evidence is necessarily conflicting, but... Could you help kind of clear that up for me and maybe some of the other listeners? Yeah, so that notion of of periodized recovery, which is again the work of uh, you know Dr. Shona Hulse in Australia, a big leader in this space, is this idea of you know what what phase are you in? Are you in an adaptation phase? You know, are you trying to get bigger, stronger, faster? Because if you are, you don't really want to be blunting that inflammatory signal, right? We sometimes we just oversimplify things and we think inflammation good or bad, right? When really it's, it's an important signal. It's the signal that helps you to get bigger, faster, stronger after you train. And so if you are in this sort of off season period, when you're trying to build your strength and your, your speed and all these qualities, you don't want to be doing lots of ice baths or, or taking antioxidant supplements, which will, which will buffer that. Or like you mentioned, the NSAIDs like your ibuprofens. Um, however, when you get into these optimization periods, right, which Unfortunately, in baseball, it's like a nine-month regular season of trying to optimize every single day, so it gets to be pretty tough. But that's that idea. When you're trying to optimize, you're trying to maintain the qualities that you've developed in that offseason. And so that's now when you see the guys, whether it's in the NBA, the NHL, whatever sport, doing the ice baths, doing um, you know using various you know supplements or medications to help to to uh, to buffer those. You know, that excessive inflammation because if, if the fire gets too hot, then we're going to get into some problems as well. But it is interesting how you can try to use hot baths and cold baths at different times of your uh, periodization to help to support, you know, whatever element you're really trying to focus on. Absolutely. And, and just again, to, to circle back around, that's why I think, you know, reading a book like yours or trying to gain as much information you can, as much knowledge you can, is valuable because there are so many different uh, thought processes, you know, so many of these things, you can't just say, are ice baths good or are they bad? Because certain times they're good, certain times they're bad for each athlete is going to respond differently or have different preferences. Um, so the more knowledge you can have and the better you can get to understand your own body and how you work, uh, the absolute better you can possibly be. So again, like I said, I know I said it a few times before, but I'm going to link your book down below. Uh, you talk about that. You talk about a number of other topics as well. Um, you, a minute ago, you briefly hit on supplements. Uh, you have a whole chapter developed to supplements in your book, and there's a lot of great charts and takeaways, uh, that, that give some references and advices for, uh, which ones we should maybe take for different needs and different athletes. Um, I, I would say for most of the athletes that I speak to, most of the younger athletes at least, uh, they have the biggest question about creatine, or I would say most of the parents have questions about creatine. And it seems like all of the research is crystal clear on it, uh, but a lot of the people who are listening maybe haven't read the scientific papers or read the journals or maybe just researched it um, other than you know reading an article in a, in a men's health type magazine. 
So for cre- sure, I, I know creatine's got a lot of benefits, but I'd love I'd love to hear your take on creatine and maybe a couple of other um, supplements that you recommend. Yeah, it is um, always fascinating how we can have a lot of emotional connection to certain terms. You know, even like red meat or steak has all these connotations and misinformation around you know whether it's good or bad for you. And certain things like creatine, we tend to associate with you know high school level athletes trying to improve their lean muscle mass and whatnot. And, you know, you're very right in the book. We, I touch on supplements in the various different chapters and there's a, a repetition that tends to happen. So you start seeing the same names of supplements popping up in a chapter on performance and then another chapter on immunity and another chapter on recovery. Because when we do look at the research, there's really only a handful of ones that we know for sure are going to really help you in terms of, of performance. There's other ones that can potentially give you benefit, but potentially might not give you anything. And creatine is definitely one of those supplements. I mean, it's not just, we know all of the you know, ergogenic benefits in terms of helping to support things like power and strength and speed. But one of the things we, you know, a couple of things that we tend to forget is that on the recovery side of things, it's very supportive, right? So creatine does a lot of things when it comes to recovery, you know, enhancing fuel replacement, increasing post-training muscle protein synthesis, stimulating some of these genetic growth factors that we need to recover more quickly, right? Reducing things like exercise induced muscle damage and inflammation and, and delaying some of those excessive, you know, muscle soreness and DOMS that you might get. So that's definitely one where, you know, in baseball, it was probably more athletes who are, who are taking creatine and that's not just a good thing for the performance side, but again, that recovery side, which is so crucial. And in the book, we even talk about endurance athletes, how it can actually really benefit them as well. But one thing we tend to forget as well, even around creatine is, again, you know, head trauma is a buzzword and, you know, young athletes, you know, up in Canada, ice hockey is obviously the big sport and and head trauma is a big problem. Whether you're playing football, obviously even in baseball, head trauma can be an issue as well. And this is where creatine's actually got some really, you know, initial but uh, very compelling research around being able to support uh, recovery post head trauma because you're effectively supplying an energy source to the brain and and after a head trauma you know we effectively have an energy crisis in the brain so supplying creatine can help keep the the levels the cellular atp levels pretty constant and it also does something else that's really specific to uh, supporting uh, concussion recovery and that's you get these changes in electrolytes uh, that happen in the brain and So creatine actually prevents this influx of calcium into the cell, which is one of the things that leads to a lot of the um, post-head trauma concussion symptoms, right? So it's not actually the initial trauma that leads to a lot of the symptoms that you get from a concussion. It's what we call these secondary effects. And one of them is this influx of calcium into the cell, as well as even, you know, an increase in reactive oxygen species. So, um, you know, those things are all mitigated or, or to some degree by things like creatine. And so you could actually make a pretty convincing argument that, you know, if you're a young athlete playing a sport where head trauma is a risk and ironically, you know, girls are more at risk than, than boys in terms of, we talk about adolescents and teens in terms of head trauma. Uh, So things like softball, women's softball, women's soccer, women's ice hockey is actually the number one sport for head trauma. Um, You could make a convincing argument that actually, you know, creatine would be a great thing to take preventatively to help, Um, If they did eventually have any kind of uh, head, um, you know, an injury or head trauma. And then even on top of that, we actually see research showing that creatine helps with things like working memory, you know, cognitive performance in both young people and older folks, you know, people who are maybe struggling with signs of things like, you know, pre-dementia. And so, you know, creatine definitely has a lot of potential benefit and it's very particular when it comes to you know, when it comes to supplementation, because it's actually doing something that you wouldn't be able to achieve from food alone. You know, you have about 90 to 92% saturation of the tissues with it, with your diet. If you're vegetarian, it could be down to about 70% saturation of of creatine. But when you supplement, you bump that up to a hundred percent, if not higher. And so that's really a powerful effect of a supplement. When you can take something that's going to give you this, you know, a little added benefit that even food alone uh, can't provide. I think another important thing, you know, people realize too is you would think with all those benefits that creatine would be outrageously priced, but other than multivitamins, <laughs> it's like the cheapest yeah. supplement you can buy. I mean, you can and buy. That's you, just it. 
I'm sorry. Go and ahead. even the the creatine monohydrate is the form used in all these studies, and that's the cheapest one. You know, so it really is. It's almost like no excuse, right? Yeah, I think you can buy like a three month supply for you know less than twenty bucks, or, or maybe it's even longer than that. But uh, very very reasonable. Um, I, I've not seen any convincing evidence that an athlete should not take it. So. Uh, again, if there's a parent out there listening and you're still on the fence, you know, is it okay for your child? Definitely do whatever research makes you feel comfortable. Um, but, but everyone I speak to, everything I read has nothing but positive, uh, effects, so to speak. Um, and again, you do have an entire section of your book talking about supercharging and talking about supplements and talking about other topics, but what would be a couple of the other, you know, maybe supplements I know that are scientifically proven, uh, to be effective because there is a lot out there uh, that are you know kind of smoke and mirrors, but there are some that actually do work and have science behind them. What would be some of the other ones you might recommend, and what would be their purposes? Yeah, I mean, I think another one if we keep on this recovery front is around you know connective tissue, you know uh, ligaments. Uh, so this is where uh, research from a guy named Keith Barr at UC Davis in the last you know five or six years has shown that supplementing with collagen. So, you know, 15 gram dose of collagen with a little bit of vitamin C. So maybe you squeeze a bit of lemon as you mix this powder into a drink or a tea. You know, doing that an hour before exercise can really help the uptake into the, you know, into the connective tissue and, and tendons and ligaments. And you see that, you know, for even things like, you know, knee ligaments, we see increases in uh, strength and density. And so that's a pretty nice way of, of supporting recovery because, you know, unless you're really eating kind of nose to tail and then doing these sort of bone broth soups that you would, uh, you know, do if you cook the whole, you know, the whole chicken, et cetera. And even then you'd have to do quite a lot of it to get to this therapeutic dose. You, you're just not going to get as much of this from the diet, right? Because we, we tend to eat more of the muscle meats, you know, compared to years and years ago when we were, you know, eating the whole animal, so to speak. So that's where, you know, a supplemental collagen is pretty straightforward. Again, not a very cost-effective supplement. Having you know that about 15 gram dose, which is about a tablespoon, you know, stir that into a drink. You see now a lot of teams. I know the you know Chicago Cubs. They do these gelatin gummies. So you put a bit of things like tart cherry juice, which is another high antioxidant juice that helps a bit with recovery. And they put the gelatin in there as well. And then so guys eat them almost like they're having gummy bears, you know, as they're going out. And so that's gonna be, you know, kind of a creative way, especially if you got kids and you're trying to find ways of getting some of this stuff in of, of, of making things palatable and, and, and providing some health benefits as well. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely agree with that. Collagen, um, you know, seems to be, it seems to be a newer, uh, a newer trend that I think people are kind of jumping on board with more recently. Uh, and like I said, there, there's a lot of them in the book. We don't need to go over every single one of them. Uh, cause I, there are a couple other topics I want to cover, uh, with you while I got you, while I've got you here. Um, one of them was, and again, slightly different, but it's the same topic. You know, one of the one of the sections of the book that I thought was just really, really good, and I actually marked it down, I highlighted, underlined it, and I ordered a book or two that you referenced when you were writing it. Um, you talked about wisdom versus intelligence. I'd love to have you go in a little bit more detail about that. A little more detail about that. Yeah, so that last section of the book there, the supercharged section, is all about the brain. And, you know, the first chapter, we sort of go into the nutrition to support brain health. And then as we walk through the other chapters, we go through things like, you know, emotions. And then in the final chapter, where you mentioned there, wisdom versus intelligence, that's on the leadership side. And, and this is pretty compelling research by a guy named Igor Grossman, who you know, uh, works in Canada at a University of Waterloo. And this is as it relates to interpersonal conflict. So, you know, imagine you're in, in a you know, an argument with somebody, you know, how how do you sort of resolve these things or what are some of the things that come into play? And when you think of intelligence, right, intelligence is really the ability to acquire and apply knowledge. Now, wisdom is not the same thing, right? Wisdom is the quality of having experience, knowledge, as well as good judgment. And so this was a fascinating study because what Igor and his colleague Justin Brianza did the first part of the study they interviewed, um, excuse me, they sent out a survey to about 2,000 people and they wanted, they had a spectrum, sort of low income, middle income, high income to be able to see if there was a difference between the different groups. And, you know, the, the questionnaire was asking around, you know, in a recent conflict with a friend or family member, you know, did you consider the other person's point of view? 
Did you consider a third per, a third party point of view? Did you consider that you might be wrong, right? And so, you know, amazingly, if you were in a lower social class, they scored about 100% better in terms of wise reasoning. So the people in the lower class were actually more likely to think about what the other person's point of view might be versus people who were, you know, typically a higher social class is associated with more emphasis on things like intelligence. So, you know, school scores, test scores, rather than things like conflict resolution, you know, getting out of a, of a problem or figuring out a way that, that suits everyone. And they, they had a second arm of this study too, where they did live interviews with about 200 people, similar thing. The person had read a, you know, these letters around a conflict and they were asked these questions again around, you know, what do you think went wrong? Would you ever consider a third party's perspective? And again, this this idea of pragmatic reasoning was far stronger in the lower social class than the higher social class. And so effectively what they're saying is this idea of wise reasoning, right? Of being able to think about the broader context, of looking for compromises rather than trying to show that you're right, emotions and behaviors of the other person to then help that guide you in figuring out the best solution. All of those things were, were better in the, in the lower social classes. And so it, it emphasizes this idea that we can't just try to um, outthink every problem. Um, we need to be compassionate in how we look at some of these problems. And, you know, depending on, you know, your neighborhood or where you grew up and anything else, you might, you might fall into some of these traps. And so this is where a player might struggle to get, get along with a coach or there might be a conflict between players. And, you know, focusing in on more of this sort of wise reasoning is, is interesting because we, we do live in an age of kind of a me first attitude with, you know, things like social media dominating uh, these days. And with that, you do see, you know, the, the, the psychology research will tell you there's this increase in individualism which is great for things like self-reliance, but there's also an increase in, in narcissism as well, where we always think that we're right and that our point is the most important point. And, you know, as you know, Zan, in, in a team sport, you've got to get everyone on the same page and pulling for each other. And I think team sports can obviously be great in fostering that, but sometimes sometimes there's there's conflict and, and having this sort of um, way of, of, of navigating that is is pretty important. Uh, you know, I thought when I read that it, from a coaching standpoint, I think back to different players that I've coached. And I thought maybe if I would have taken into account their background a little bit more, maybe their family history a little bit more, maybe I could have had a better, you know, resolution to this conflict or maybe I could have had a better outcome. Um, and, and that's where, you, you know, again, I've said it a number of times, but that's why I liked your book so much because it covers so many different topics. Um, you, you know, you'd like to think that as specific as most books are now they dive really really deep into one topic uh or even a video or a presentation or a course you know you try to dive as deep as you can into one topic but you don't scratch the surface on very many at all uh where your book's a little bit different and you know we've talked about nutrition recovery supplementation uh we've talked about leadership qualities and and, and these type strategies right here very interesting and actually one of the books you referenced in that section of your book i think it was called uh, the wisdom of psychopaths. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I've actually bought it on Amazon and, uh, it's, it's on my bookshelf. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. Uh, but I'm planning on reading that. And there were a lot of references in your book, like I said, that I, that I marked and, uh, le definitely looking forward to reading that one though. Yeah. That's a guy out of, um, you know, Kevin Dutton out of Oxford university, a psychologist who works with, um, you know, psychopaths in terms of figuring out, you know, the qualities that they, the traits that they possess. And there's a whole collection of different traits that they do possess. And ironically, you know, a lot of the traits are shared by CEOs and upper executives, as well as, you know, the Tiger Woodses of the world and the Roger Federer's and the Serena Williams. Now, there's obviously a few key ones that they don't have that make it so that they're not psychopaths. But um, it's interesting at that notion of trying to be a killer on the court in terms of your your ruthlessness, but then off the court being compassionate and humble um, and and that those qualities is sort of in the end what he what he highlights and again even for Igor's work you know I had him recently on my podcast so if people want to dive more into that I mean I don't do his, his research justice there but I think one of the nice take-homes that he had even around trying to improve this wise reasoning if we circle back to that was to try to think of problems in the third person 
It's almost like, you know, rather than using yourself as I, you give yourself, you know, call yourself by your name or give yourself another name and, and try to view that whole problem like a, you know, from a third party's perspective. And and that has been shown to really improve uh, outcomes. So. Yeah, well, man, really interesting. Like I said, I, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, that section. There was, an, there was another part of that section that I thought was super interesting as well. It was called delusional confidence versus contingent confidence. Um, again, I'd love to have you reference that and kind of talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, confidence, obviously, you need confidence to be at the highest level. Um, and this is where actually a, a journalist named uh, Eric Barker a few years ago, he wrote a terrific book called Barking Up the Wrong Tree and talked to introduced me to the science of you know, delusional confidence being this idea of, of, you know, having a higher estimation of what your abilities really are. And of course, at the highest level of sport, you need a little bit of delusional confidence, right? If you're going to square up against LeBron and Lionel Messi and, and Clayton Kershaw. But, um, you know, in today's world, delusional confidence can be a bit of a problem as well. If you're, you know, a young social media superstar at your whatever environment that you're in, you know, you're, you, you're more of a success on that scale than you really are on the pitch or the field. And if you do have a, a bad game or a bad season, then your world can really come crashing down. And so if your confidence is only, delu- you know, is, is excessively delusional, then, then this is going to be a big problem in terms of recovery. So a little bit of delusional confidence, okay. Too much can be a, a big problem in terms of, of just crushing your overall ability to perform. The flip side to that is what we call contingent confidence. And this is one where, you know, even the best athletes in the world uh, may not realize how attached they are to their outcomes. And a really great example of this, Rory McIlroy, you know, one of the best golfers on the planet. Um, he's actually been really open recently and actively trying to not let his results, you know, the score that he shoots dictate his mood for the day. And that might sound strange because you think, geez, this is the one of the best golfers on the planet, maybe one of the best swingers at the golf club in history. And if you watch any golf, you can basically tell how well Rory's playing just by how he's walking. Like if he's playing well, he's strutting up and down the fairway. He's got this balance in his step. He looks like, a, you know, he's on top of the world. And if he's playing poorly, I mean, the shoulders are slumped. He's dragging his feet. He's cursing. And of course, he hasn't, you know, he won a whole bunch of majors a, a while back, uh, you know, at the age of 25, he already had four majors and hasn't won one in, in maybe five years now. And he's done a lot of book, a lot of, um, excuse me, work on, on trying to detach himself from being so, con, you know, his confidence being so directly related to, to his performance outcomes. Right. And so even books like you mentioned, uh, one of the books he's reading, Digital Minimalism, <laughs> Choosing a Focused Life in a Noisy World. And so I think the take home for the rest of us is that, you know, if the best athletes in the world can still be too attached to their outcomes, you know, we can learn a thing or two about that as well. If we're just trying to, you know, win the beef light club championship or if you're trying to make the baseball team <laughs> member, or whatever member, it might be. Yeah. Yeah, because you're always you're always looking up. So even if the athlete is at an elite level, you don't realize that they're still looking up from where they are. And so the problem for them can actually be very similar to to the problem you're having, even though you're an amateur level baseball player and you're you know you're looking at Vladdy Guerrero or somebody who's playing pro ball. But they're you know the problems are similar across domains, and and that's where you know in the book we talk about things like mindfulness being a a bit of an antidote for for having your confidence being too contingent on on your outcomes. Yeah, you know, when I read that, I, I thought about a lot of the guys that I coach with Team USA, uh, guys who are very high-profile players, and for good reason. They're very, very talented athletes, um, but they have large social media followings at a young age. And we're talking about guys who are, you know, 14, 15, 16 years old who already have, you know, tens of thousands of followers, um, and, and they get picked apart based on what they do or how they act or their performance. Uh, and, and so I thought that was really interesting. I think it applies to a lot of people. Uh, not just the professional athlete, but the younger guys as well, who maybe are coming up in this world with the the Instagram and the social media, um, and, and you know, teaching guys how to deal with that is an important part of it, so that they can, uh, you know, have have success before or after a good or bad performance. So, um, really interesting, and I definitely enjoyed your thoughts on that. 
Um, definitely looking forward to picking up the wisdom of psych or reading the wisdom of psychopaths. And some of the <laughs> yeah, other that's books a good one that you uh, that you mentioned. You can there. Do the test. Do the test. Then let me know Uh-oh. how it goes. Okay. <laughs> well, wh- before I let you off here, so you, like I said, you mentioned so many good books. Do you have any references? Uh, we're definitely going to recommend your book to, to the listeners, but to people like me or to maybe somebody who's listening to the show, do you have any other books that you've referenced that you think people might find interesting or useful? Um. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole bunch in the book. Some of the ones that I've been reading recently, one of them is called Silence in the Age of Noise. And I wish I could remember the author's name. He's a, he's a Norwegian um, adventurer. So he treks across the you know the Antarctic and whatnot. And it's sort of a collection of little short stories, but there's some great lines in that one. Um, and another book I actually recommended, I read years ago when I was, you know, after university, but it's a really great um, book on the mindset piece. But it's, you know, Taoism is a, is a, you know, uh, form of, uh, thinking. And this is called the, the Tao of Pooh. So it's based on around Winnie the Pooh. So it gives you this, all these deep metaphorical stories, but you know, through the lens of Winnie the Pooh and the characters in that, in that cartoon. So it's, it's kind of a neat way of, of learning something that's really complex and in a, in a simple way. And it really sticks. Well, I'm definitely going to check those out. And like I said, I'll link those below so everybody else can, uh, can check them out as well. I know we mentioned you have your podcast. You've got a website. You're active on social media as well. Uh, for the people that want to follow you or maybe get to know a little bit more about you, where, where can they find you and what would be a, a, a good way for them to uh, locate you online? Yeah, if you want to connect, I mean, all the social media channels, I'm at Dr. Bubbs. Uh, D-R-B-U-B-B-S. I got a funny last name, so I tend to come up. Um, the website is drbubs.com. And then if you're looking for things specific for the book, uh, athleteevolution.org is where you can check out some of the expert uh, insights and info on the on Peak. Well, Mark, definitely appreciate you coming on. Uh, you know, like I said before, the book was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. Today, we barely got to scratch the surface and only only covered a few of the topics that are, are mentioned and covered in great detail. Um, but definitely, everybody should pick it up, check it out. You will learn something from it. I promise you that. Uh, but thank you for your time. We definitely appreciate you coming on here and sharing your wisdom. Um, and look forward to talking to you again soon. Awesome, Zan. Thanks so much for having me on. Thanks for listening to the Train with Zan podcast. Where our goal is to help you look, feel, and perform like an athlete. Be sure to subscribe wherever you're listening and follow Zan on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. The training doesn't have to stop here. For today's show notes and more information about training, nutrition, and fitness, head on over to trainwithzan.com and join the team. 